Oh my goodness, it's Monday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and today we have an FBI show. That means from the Big Island. We're going to talk about hydrogen from the Big Island. And we have our, our co host, Marco Mangelsdorf, who's the CEO of ProVision Solar in, in Hilo. And uh, our other guest, uh, who is Paul Pantio, and he is the director and CCO of Blue Planet Research, which is uh, up there above Kona, I guess in the most beautiful part of the Big Island uh, with a hydrogen facility, we want to know about it. Hi, gentlemen, how are you? Hi, Jay. Marco. Great to be, great to be back with you, my friend Jay, uh, calling, uh, we're talking, I'm talking from the, the San Francisco South Bay Area and I am so appreciative of my friend Paul uh, agreeing to uh, share his wisdom and insight with us today. So thank you so much, Paul, for being on with uh, Jay and I today. Well, it, it falls on you, Marco, to uh, be as a co-host to introduce Paul and just give, a, give us some, some, some parameters on him. Well, Paul is uh, one of those people I think of as a brother from a distant mother in terms of uh, being on the, the side of goodness and light and renewable energy and, and trying to do the right thing, not only for the Big Island and the state of Hawaii, but for the planet writ large. He's not a, a brother of an, uh, another different mother uh, that is, excuse me, his, his longtime friend, uh, Hank Rogers of Blue Planet. So. Paul has been doing such cool things over the years uh, at the ranch there um, on the west side of the Big Island that uh, Hank has in terms of renewable energy, uh, making his own hydrogen, and just uh, being one of those visionaries who has been working for years putting out uh, a, a, an image and a reality, hopefully reality, of what the island can become in terms of clean renewable energy, uh, which hopefully over time will use uh, hydrogen gas in greater and greater quantities. So uh, I just have a lot of respect and a lot of aloha for Paul, and I'm just so pleased that uh, he has some time to talk with us today. Paul, well, am I right to say that uh, the Blue Planet research is focused largely on hydrogen, at least in your facility? And am I right to say that, that <clears throat> hydrogen is, is um, probably lives most in terms of use and research on the Big Island? Am I right to say that? Oh, that's close. Um, what we do here at Blue Planet Research, or we, we just say BTR, um, is renewable energy storage research. So anything that stores the energy from flywheels to batteries to hydrogen, we're interested in it. And this is what we came together to do, to find out how to make renewable energy work closer to baseload. Um, that's always been the Achilles heel of renewables. And when Hank and I started this project uh, years and years ago, the goal was to find out what was the best solution to make this a reality and then learn from that and show other people. So hydrogen is just one of the storage forms that we use for energy. It's an energy carrier. Uh, however, it is my, my personal favorite. Uh, that I tend to spend a little bit more time on compared to batteries. So how, how, uh, how do you compare yourself or coordinate yourself with uh, our hydrogen coordinator, Stan Osserman, who does our show on, uh, mostly on hydrogen on Fridays, <coughs> and uh, Mitch Ewan, who, 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 who does hydrogen for HNEI. Uh, what's, what's the connection? How do you work together? <laughs> Stan, Stan and Mitch are both really close friends of, of mine. We've been working on this for, well, since 2005 with Mitch and a little bit later with Stan. Stan is actually moving to the Big Island. We, we're going to be neighbors soon. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for both Mitch and Stan. Mitch has paved the way with getting all the permitting and all the red tape out of the way to get hydrogen infrastructure in place. Uh, a real quick interesting story, when Hank first bought this ranch in 2005, the very first meeting we had up here was with Mitch Ewing. Mitch came over to talk to us about hydrogen, and that's where Mitch, Mitch and I first met. Can you talk about the ranch a little bit, Paul? Um, I understand the ranch is off the grid, so what, what, what's happening at the ranch? Yeah, the ranch is our microgrid. It's our test bed that we deploy all of the 
different technologies on. So we actually live this. Uh, it's not just a laboratory setting. It's a living microgrid. It's 32 acres in size. The, the power loads and requirements are fairly low because it's, um, it was started in 1884. There's a lot of legacy old equipment and buildings here. Uh, we have no air conditioning loads because we're almost 3,000 feet in elevation, so it's relatively cool here. Um, but the, the ranch is our test bed, uh, and we use it to show other people um, an example of what can be done. Yeah. So you have uh, electrolyzers there. Can you talk about uh, what that is and how it feeds into the, the system, the uh, renewable system you developed at the ranch? Absolutely. First of all, as you said, we're off-grid, and that means 100% disconnected from the utility. Um, a couple of things happen when you go off-grid. Uh, for one thing, you have to have an oversized generation source, and in this case, it's PV. And the reason for that is because every day counts. You can't go one day by borrowing from the utility if they're not there. Um, you have to make your own power every single day. So the other thing that means is when the weather is really good, you tend to end up with too much energy. So if you size your system for worst case scenario, uh, for example, we can run the ranch loads when it's overcast, which happens every day around noon, or a little before noon. Um, we can also operate in light rain. But in the mornings, the skies are typically crystal clear blue, and we would end up throwing a tremendous amount of energy away. So while the batteries are charging and the ranch is being run, we take the excess power and we turn that into hydrogen. And we also charge electric vehicles. So any, any way that we can minimize the waste is what we're looking for. Yeah, and I recall that uh, you were into uh, Sony batteries. Am I, is that still so? Yeah, we, we started, well, we had the first vanadium redox flow battery in the state of Hawaii, and that's just a, a fancy type of, of battery. Um, unfortunately, the technology wasn't efficient enough for the type of weather that we have. We live in a microclimate up here. Uh, as I said, the mornings are crystal clear, and by 11 or 12, it's overcast. Um, we don't have enough hours to charge something like a flow battery. So that didn't work out too well. We worked with Tesla for a while, looking at their battery technology. Um, we ended up not going with Tesla because of the chemistry that they use. Um, there's a huge difference between lithium chemistries. They use cobalt. And I think the article in the paper touched upon some of the reasons we don't like cobalt. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I saw that. Co yeah. co cobalt comes from, um, well, it comes it's from ongoing. environments that um, uh, it's not fair to take the cobalt, yeah? Yeah, uh, it's, it's mostly from the Congo, and they use um, lots of child labor to mine it without any health protection. So it's, it's not a very good, um, on a moral issue alone, it's not a very good technology. Mm -hmm. Now what cobalt has in its favor is that it's lightweight, it's very energy dense, so it's actually good for cell phones and small stuff. Um, but anything large that's carrying a lot of energy, the potential danger and risk involved with cobalt are just not enough to justify its use. Mm -hmm. So Sony, Sony is what we ended up with. They use an olivine type uh, ferrous phosphate, lithium ferrous phosphate. And olivine is, as you know, green sand beach, same mineral. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very benign. Um, it cannot overheat and catch on fire, so it's incredibly safe. And in particular, it has about a 40% longer cycle life, so it lasts 40% longer. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, uh, Marco, um, can, can you talk about the um, recent developments in the county? Uh, over uh, hydrogen buses, and, um, and and you know maybe you can frame some questions to Paul about that. Yeah, I think I'll let I'll let Paul get into that because he's kind of more uh, more knowledgeable about kind of the late breaking news about uh, one or more county buses running on hydrogen. I think I'll I'll kind of take more of a macro view, and then we'll get more more down to the micro of the Big Island. Uh, 
I just quickly did some research yesterday to see what the hydrogen fueling station situation is uh, in our state and also across the U.S. mainland and just some interesting factoids. Uh, in California, for example, there are 40 fueling stations uh, north and south of California with another 24 or so in the pipeline. So in the months to come, there will be somewhere under 70. And the total sales of fuel cell vehicles across the U.S. as of about three months ago was somewhere somewhere below 7,000 total, with Toyota, Honda, and Hyundai being the, the top three by far, with Toyota being the, the number one out of those three. So, you know, clearly in terms of hydrogen used for transportation, we're just at the beginning of hopefully a rapid uh, steep J-curve in terms of adoption. And, uh, you know, I'm particularly interested as well, of course, in, in hydrogen gas as a fuel source for generation, power generation uh, on the Big Island. And we can talk a little bit about that in, in perhaps a few minutes. Uh, but you, you zoom down to the state of Hawaii, and by my count, there's only one hydrogen fueling station in the entire state that's run by Surfco Pacific and Mapunapuna on Oahu. So with that kind of background, uh, what's kind of bedeviled me for years, Paul, and I'll, I would like to get your hit on this, is, is you know the chicken and egg question regarding hydrogen uh, in terms of supply and demand. Uh, do we provide a supply first and then hope that demand is going to come? Uh, and if so, how do we do that? And uh, I know you've, you've been working in the trenches on that question for years, so I'd really be interested in hearing kind of your take on on what comes first. Do they both come at the same time? How do you calibrate? Because obviously it doesn't make sense to make a whole bunch of hydrogen if there isn't going to be a consumer for the hydrogen. And then the consumer for the hydrogen isn't going to buy the vehicle or vehicles unless there's a reliable source of hydrogen. So what What's your what's your approach on that? Yeah, that's um, you, you've hit the nail on the head with that. It, it's always been the chicken and the egg, and you explained it very very clearly. The solution, in my opinion, is to not do what California did, where they invested a huge amount of capital into developing the infrastructure, um, even while they were waiting for the vehicles to come. Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, what we would prefer to do is put in small hydrogen systems that are scalable and scale the production as the demand grows. Right now, we have a glut of hydrogen fuel cell EVs, in particular Toyotas. And a lot of these are being turned in at the end of leases. Uh, and they're being recertified as pre-owned used vehicles that you can pick up for um, actually quite cheap. Um, the numbers I'm hearing are something like $15,000 versus the original $60,000 price tag. So that makes buying the, the use component of it uh, very affordable. But obviously we need to focus on public transportation at the same time, if not first. So doing a bus system and providing just the amount of hydrogen needed to maintain that particular application makes the most sense to me. Because as we add more buses, we can easily scale up the hydrogen equipment. Now, it does require using a specific type of equipment. There are a few companies around that make small hydrogen dispensing systems as well as generation. Um, in particular, the company that makes our equipment is uh, Millennium Rain out of Dayton, Ohio, the U.S. company. They make a, a range of different size or output models of hydrogen. So the point I'm making is if you have a bus that uses 20 kilograms per day of hydrogen for its route, you can supply that bus with 20 kilograms. You don't need to store much more than that. And as you add buses, you can scale that up. Now, with the, the new bills that have just been passed, allowing the county to purchase or pro do um, transportation procurement. That's, the, that's what I was asking about. I, I think that's really important. Can you, can you say what that bill provides? Yeah, so that's going to open up the door for a third party to come in and build the generation system and the, the infrastructure and also purchase the vehicles 
and then just lease that or sell that service to the county. So the county now has the ability to procure those services. So that means the county doesn't have to come up with the funds. They can be paying the same or less than what they're paying now on a daily basis to maintain the aging, crippled diesel fleet that they have. And I think on the big island, we're down to nine buses now. Out of a fleet of 60, Marco, you probably know the number. Down to me, but with 60 or 66 buses, we're down to nine. Mm -hmm. uh, and the upkeep on those buses is getting more and more expensive every day. So if a third party came in and said, here, we've got these brand new buses, they're non-polluting, they run on a renewable resource, and we'll lease these to you for X, then that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so this is, this is in many ways um, uh, ground uh, groundbreaking, isn't it? We're going to have a system on the Big Island that will be quite remarkable um, if we can put it together. What, what are the steps necessary to put it together? And, and what is the role of Blue Planet Research in all of that? Uh, Blue Planet Research's role is just kind of helping with the coordination. Uh, we're working with several different groups, uh, including some private entities who may want to invest in the technology and the infrastructure. Um, there's no mistake that, that this is hydrogen's year. Um, if you just look at the amount of movement that's taking place worldwide, and especially in the U.S. and Hawaii, it's hard to deny that this isn't building enough momentum to sustain it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we've finally gotten to the point. You know, the meeting I mentioned earlier with Mitch um, 15 years ago, <laughs> yeah. we thought in two years we would be on our way and we'd be running on hydrogen. Well, it took a little longer than we thought, but it's definitely here now, but and it as evidenced by the car companies. Well, the, the, uh, the, the availability of the buses, the availability, hypothetically, of the uh, hydrogen, and the buy-in by the county government here signals a, a whole new time in hydrogen for Hawaii, because it suggests to me, anyway, that other islands um, will follow. Don't, don't you think they will? I think that would be the natural progression. And, you know, it's a typical old thing where no one wants to be the first. But as soon as someone breaks that ground and places that trail, mm -hmm. It's easy to get people to join in. I think. Yeah. Now this could be a big time for hydrogen, and it is, that's why I was asking. You know, is 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 hydrogen focused these days? I know there are facilities here, and Surfco, you know, gives you hydrogen if you lease a, a Marai and all that at its uh, Mapuna Puna facility, and of course there's hydrogen facilities on the military. But um, sounds like hydrogen, at least as far as, pu as public transportation is concerned. Is, is beginning to focus on the Big Island now, uh, and it may be where hydrogen, and, and of course you guys are doing research with it, so it may be that um, hydrogen is going to start to, you know, come alive in the Big Island more than any other place. Do you, do you agree with that, or am I overstating the case? No, I think you're, you're right, and, and one of the main reasons is because we need it more than any of the other islands. The, the Big Island being 4,000 square miles in size, we've got range issues, we've got elevation challenges that the other islands may not have. So it makes sense to do it here. And the silly part of this, this whole story is the two camps between the electric, pure electric vehicles and the hydrogen electric, they're both electric. And we have to quit thinking that one is better than the other. They're not. It's just different applications. If you can run on a pure electric vehicle for short distances, that's more efficient than the hydrogen side. The problem is those electric vehicles can't make the run to Hilo and back to Kona or to South Point. They just don't have the range. And we have a Tesla Model X here at the ranch, and it's pushing it to try to go to Volcano and back. Mm. And, you know, it's got a 230-mile range, but the Mirai has a 320-mile range and only takes five minutes to refuel. Yeah, that's, that's compelling. <clears throat> but the uh, issue, as Marco brought up before, is <clears throat> exactly how much hydrogen do you make for that, for the consumer market, for the individual passenger car market, how, how much do you make? And you have to 
time your you know, production. One thing it's, that strikes me, though, is that with hydrogen in steel tanks, uh, you can make it in advance. You can stockpile hydrogen uh, and let it sit and wait for the market to catch up. I mean, I don't know how long it can wait, uh, but it seems to me there's, a, you know, there's an opportunity there um, to, to stockpile it somewhere and keep it at the Absolutely. ready, waiting for the cars, no? Yes, uh, I mean, hydrogen never loses its energy unless it just leaks out. It's literally there for eternity. Um, so you can stockpile as much as you want, and, and that would definitely be the, the way we would do it um, and have a certain amount of surplus for them. Now, one of the things that when we, when we talk about other than transportation, for example, uh, the military across the board has a mandate now for 14 days of economy. They need 14 days of backup generation. Well, you could do it with batteries, technically, but it would be crazy to try and do that. The cost of warehousing electrons for using them every couple of months in an emergency would be astronomically expensive. Now, if you combine batteries with hydrogen, and you use your batteries for your power, for your daily turnover of electrons, and store your backup in the form of hydrogen, now you have something economical uh, that makes sense. And you can do the hydrogen side for about a third of the cost of batteries. And once your storage is full, you still make hydrogen for other uses. You can use that for transportation or ground support equipment. You know, the airport has, in Kona has had this in their master plan for 15 years now to put in hydrogen. And all the ground support equipment, the baggage tugs, the airlines, could all be running on hydrogen instead of propane. Yeah, what's, what's more is that you can, you can move hydrogen around the state in those tanks. In fact, you can move yeah. it outside the state in those tanks and and you can take your time about it, and uh, you can take advantage of the cheapest method of transportation. Don't have to lay cables or anything like that. So there's, there's really an advantage uh, statewide. But my question, I don't know, you really haven't gotten into this yet, but how do you make it? How do you make it efficiently? How do you make it cheaply? Um, my recollection is to buy even a moderate uh, size of uh, electrolyzers is going to cost $100,000. Uh, how, how can you do that at a commercial, a commercial quantity, um, you know, so that it can fit into this whole new system of hydrogen? And, and query also, where does, where does ge geothermal fit in all that? There was so much discussion about geothermal producing hydrogen right there in Pune. Uh, so can, can you tell us where it's going to come from and how expensive it's going to be? Yeah, you just gave me the perfect segue. Um, <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah, I was about to touch on geothermal. Now, right now we know we can make hydrogen on par or cheaper than gasoline. Now, we can't do that with the utilities cost of power, obviously. However, if we use renewable energy, and in particular, this is another reason why the Big Island is the place to start first. We have over seven and a half gigawatts of potential renewable energy available on this island alone. If we were to tap into all the resources from solar to wind to hydro to geothermal, we could not only make all of the transportation fuel for the entire state, we would be exporting it as a product to California and possibly Japan. So it's an industry that's going to generate new jobs, new high-tech, well-paying jobs, uh, so that we can quit exporting our cakeys and keep mm -hmm. them home. Um, geothermal is, is one of the keys. Now, this is a hot-button topic, obviously, but everyone bases geothermal on the experience of Puna. Uh, there are new technologies available that can make it much safer. You can do it on very small scales, but the cost of your electricity to electrolyze water is one of the things that's going to determine the cost of the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. The equipment cost is pretty fixed. It's your energy cost that's the variable. Now, electrolysis is only one way to make hydrogen. Right now, the county flares methane from the landfill 
and the quantities enough to provide each bus 700 miles a day of transportation route. Now, obviously, the buses don't do 700 hours, but that's how much we're flaring right now, just in the form of burning gas. Methane is CH4. There's four hydrogen atoms for every carbon. You can extract that hydrogen from the methane. Now you have a source of hydrogen that was typically thrown away in the form of heat and CO2 before. Do we so have the, do we have the process of available? Do we have that technology working now? How, how far away off are we from having that technology working? This is all technology that exists today. This mm -hmm. is nothing that's you know, science fiction and in the future. This is what's available now. We just need to deploy it. Mm -hmm. Marco, you must have a million questions for Paul. Why don't, why don't you launch into some of them? And what, what you're referring to, Paul, is in terms of breaking up the hydrocarbon molecule of methane or propane or butane is steam reformation, right? Right. That's the, the most common technology of today. Yeah, which there are seen. better technologies which aren't commercialized yet, but that's what we could start with. And listen, a little bit of CO2 from steam reformation is certainly better than methane going into the atmosphere. And if you burn it, you're producing CO2 anyway. Well, I'm going to ask a question, but I'm going to sketch something out first before I get to my question. And I'm going to sketch out the following. So in order to get to anywhere close to 100% renewable energy and power generation in the decades to come on the Big Island, it's my conclusion that uh, renewable energy, which is variable, solar or wind, and batteries, is not going to get us across the finish line. Why? Because we are going to continue to need some type of combustion generation as a backup, as a security security policy in the event that we have difficulties with renewable energy and or storage. So if you look at the power generation backbone of the Big Island, the two largest power plants are at Keahole, which is about 80 megawatts, and that's owned by Helco. And then there's a 60 megawatt plant in Honaka, which is Hamaku Energy, owned by Pacific Current, which is an unregulated subsidiary of Hawaiian Electric Industries. Each of those plants has two, count them, two, General Electric LM2500 combustion turbines. And those turbines, as far as I know, in the, in the brief research I've, I've done, can be converted to different fuels other than hydrocarbon-based fuels. So obviously, if you're running large combustion turbines on a scale like that, and you convert them to hydrogen, you're going to want to have obviously a very high confidence that you can get hydrogen in adequate quantities to be able to power the turbines uh, not only adequate quantities but at a uh, cost-effective price so my question to you paul is have you done any crunching or has mitch done any crunching or stan done any crunching in terms of the type or not the type, but the quantity of hydrogen that would be needed to power the largest power plants on the island and those four 2,500 combustion turbines? Uh, the answer is no. We've been focused mostly on transportation. However, if you look at what's happening in Australia right now, Australia is just decommissioning coal-fired power plants, and they are converting them to run on hydrogen. Now, if they can get a coal-fired plant to run efficiently and cost-effectively on hydrogen, uh, we can certainly do a, an already existing gas-fired turbine more cost-effectively. And it, again, depends on the amount of hydrogen you can produce, as you stated. And that is really just dictated by the cost of your energy. The equipment side, the hardware, that's all available now and it's scalable. Uh, but we need to have a low cost solution of energy. But if you compare it, you know, I mean, we could get on soapboxes here and talk about just purely economic issues or moral issues. But the bottom line is we really don't have a choice. We have to start doing something. Uh, we can't wait for everything to run out or for sea rise to start eating all the Pacific Islands. Well, is there, you, is there anybody addressing this? Because it sounds to me like once you achieve a hydrogen-based transportation system on the Big Island, the very next step is to go where Marco was talking about, 
uh, you know, to yeah. figure out how to get a, a, a reasonable supply at a reasonable price and then convert the power plants uh, to use hydrogen. And that would be remarkable. That would be, that would be headline news. That would be a game changer on the Big Island and maybe elsewhere. But it all depends on finding, you know, the way to produce uh, sufficient hydrogen at a reasonable price. So who's right. working and on that, Paul? You, you think you'll be working on that? Who's going to work on that? Well, there's a good chance that, you know, there are a lot of smart people in Hawaii, and that is the logical next step in, in the progression of things. But we can learn what's being done by other countries and by other companies. Uh, they are working on that right now in Australia. So this is kind of goes back to the, the silver bullet statement. Now, we have to use everything that we have available, the silver buckshot type approach. Um, well, well, believe it or not, you'd be surprised at what the real obstacle to the deployment of hydrogen is. We all think the first thing that comes up is the cost, economics. It's the safety of hydrogen. It's the storage of it. It's actually the, the public perce uh, perception of hydrogen that is the real obstacle at this point. And we've experienced this firsthand over and over again. People think hydrogen is incredibly dangerous when the truth is it's actually the opposite. It's the safest flammable gas that we have. Mm -hmm. It's a flammable gas, so you have to handle it with respect just like any other flammable gas. But there are properties of hydrogen that make it far safer than propane or butane or any other hydrocarbon fuel. Well, we have to get so into it more. We have to, you know, we have to see that and, and educate the public about it in the course of this transition to the buses. But one thing seems, best, sorry? I was going to say, that, and the best way to do that is to start with public transportation. Yes, I agree. And, and one thing seems clear, though. I, I, it's, I think in the future, for, for all three of us, there's a, there's a trip to Australia. We have to go down there and see what they did. We have to talk to them and, um, you know, and drink beer. What can I say? Um, that, that's the future, to find out how they did that. Marco, you interested? Let's go. As long as I can get into business class so I don't get crunched back in the proletariat section, my friend. <laughs> oh, okay. And Paul, <laughs> have you been there? Shouldn't we go there now? Well, actually, Hank has been there, and Hank has been talking to some of these people. Uh, Australia, I, mean, I mentioned what we could be doing by exporting hydrogen from the Big Island. Well, Australia is doing just that. They have just signed contracts with Japan to ship them hydrogen instead of coal. Kawasaki, Mitsubishi, these large industrial companies are building ships specifically designed to carry hydrogen. So it's coming. It's and, coming. You know, and we don't want to be the last ones on the planet to, no. to clue in. And, and what's interesting, it's, it's, um, it's related in, in a funny way. This is related um, to the LNG ships that are being built. And one of the Trump yeah. administration initiatives is to try to sell LNG through, through uh, Japan uh, to China and a good part of, uh, of, of points west of that and Southeast Asia and so forth. So we have an initiative involving the development of these transportation systems that will carry gas. And if you can carry one kind of gas, then arguably you convert it uh, to another kind of gas, maybe hydrogen. So maybe it's not in small tanks, maybe it's in big tanks, as long as we can create it or draw it off methane in the first place. Uh, gentlemen, we're out of time. I'm so sorry about that. Thank you so much, Marco, for uh, setting this up. Marco, can you say goodbye? Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Marco. Aloha. We'll do this again. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I think you should do your next show from the ranch over here. Here, here. Okay. I second that motion. Okay, okay. First the ranch and then Melbourne. All right. Aloha, everyone. Aloha, Bye -bye. everyone. <laughs>